So thank you all for joining us for this uh, new webinar organized by the new society, the new French Society of Atherosclerosis. Uh, so this webinar on uh, innovative technologies to investigate uh, atherosclerosis. So here, of course, we're thinking first and foremost of uh, single cell RNA sequencing, spatial transcriptomics, and uh, finally, more generally, uh, multiomics approaches. Indeed, uh, as you must have seen, uh, especially during the last uh, European Atherosclerosis Society meeting in Lyon, uh, that these new technologies are really essential to us to introduce uh, uh, new technologies. So these uh, new technologies uh, have slowly but surely imposed themselves on us. Uh, they were really omnipresent in the presentations during the last meeting. Uh, so they are essential uh, to enable us to gather a considerable amount of information, particularly in the field of uh, cardiometabolic diseases. Uh, but it's like anything else, when you want to get started, you never really know how to go about it. And many questions arise, what it for, what questions can I answer? More especially, what questions can't I answer with such uh, techniques? Uh, which samples do I need to start with? Uh, is it important if it's human samples, mouse samples? How do I must harvest them? Can I fix them? Uh, every question uh, an essential question like this. Uh, how must I process these samples? So if you're like me, and if you're waiting for a book on uh, multiomics for dummies, uh, there are just some of the questions this webinar will try to answer today. And what better way to do so uh, than to have with us tonight our uh, three distinguished uh, speakers who are pioneers in these fields and who I imagine uh, had uh, some problems uh, when they started with these tools. So uh, we are really uh, glad and uh, thankful to them for sharing their experience. And I'd really like to, to thank them warmly for accepting our invitation despite uh, they are extremely busy and of your schedule. So welcome to you all to this uh, webinar. So and I'd like to thank my co-chairman, Bart Sals, who is going to introduce uh, our first speaker. Thank you uh, to you. Thanks. Thank you, Benoit. So let's kick off with the first talk, which will be delivered by Professor Menno de Winter, a colleague of mine and good friend of the Department of Medical Biochemistry at the Emirates. Amsterdam University Medical Centers in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. And uh, Menno has been working since many years on atherosclerosis and applying epigenetic uh, technologies and single cell and uh, RNA sequencing on atherosclerotic plaques. So today he will deliver a talk entitled Cellular Landscape in Human and Mouse Atherosclerotic Plaques. Lessons from mac about macrophages from single cell RNA sequencing analysis. Menno, the word is yours. Thank you very much, Bart. I hope that everybody can hear me. Thank you for the kind introduction and also Benoit, thank you for uh, both for inviting me uh, to give this, this talk. Let me try to share my screen. <clears throat> there it is. I assume you can see my screen. Excellent, I see people nodding. Here I have a laser pointer. Um, so um, uh, when when Benoit and Bart asked me to talk about the work we've been doing on single cell RNA sequencing, they also added, "Can you add, like Benoit introduced in the in his in his uh, starting talk, can you add some tips and tricks and and make it maybe a bit more scholarly?" So that's what I what I try to do with the help of some of my coworkers. I uh, intertwined some of the data that we have generated over the past few years with uh, the problems, the pitfalls, what is important. I'm not sure whether I'm going to address all of the questions that you have, but I hope I can stimulate you and help you a little bit with, with thinking about uh, um, the single cell RNA sequencing world. Um, <clears throat> a brief introduction, my group works on atherosclerotic disease or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Um, patients can be treated pretty well. Lipidoning drugs are effective, but there's still a strong residual risk. And uh, part of this is a residual risk for cardiovascular patients is coming from inflammation, and as has been illustrated by different clinical trials. And we 
in my group try to understand better how inflammatory processes contribute to atherosclerosis and clinical outcome for patients. And I have been working on macrophages, um, let, let me think, for a really, really long time, almost 30 years, I think, because I started that, doing that uh, during my, my PhD already. And uh, it started really simple and uh, more and more it got complicated. And over the recent years, we have been applying multidimensional tools to better define what are the individual characteristics that we find in atherosclerotic plaques and how do they contribute to disease. And one of the technologies that we have been applying is the single cell RNA sequencing tool. And single cell RNA sequencing has been developing over the past, I would say 10, 15 years. And on this slide uh, from a paper from 2018 already, so it's already uh, quite old, you see, uh, the development of different technologies. And without going in all, all the details, you can see there has been a wide range of techniques that differ in the way they isolate the single cells, the way they label the RNA in the single cells, and the way they read out the RNA. And today uh, in my talk, uh, uh, or in my group, we have mainly been employing cell sequencing, and we have been more recently uh, mainly focusing on using the tools of 10x genomics. Okay, I think we will move on. Thank you very much, Menno, for a great talk and great discussion. And I hand over the word to Benoit for introducing the next speaker. Thanks a lot, thanks a lot, Menno. So now it's a really great pleasure to welcome also uh, Professor uh, Isabel Gonçalves. Hopefully I said it properly. <laughs> Uh, so she is a medical doctor, so she's seeing uh, patients, and she's also a scientist. Uh, she's professor of cardiology at the Skane University Hospital, and she's also heading a team at the Cardiovascular Research Center and Translational Studies uh, at Lund uh, University. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to welcome her today. Uh, she's going to talk about the use of multiple omics to map human uh, atherosclerotic plaque rupture signature, so which is a follow-up of uh, what Meno has presented. Thanks a lot, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot for accepting our invitation. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Good. Um... See it in full screen? Yes. Yes, wonderful, thank you. Well, thanks again, Benoit and Bart, for this wonderful invitation to speak to the French society. It's really exciting for me. And uh, well, I, I thought I could tell you a bit about my new home place, <laughs> which is in Sweden. Um, the Lund University has been around since the 15th century. And even though it's called Lund University, we are actually doing our research in Malmo, which is the third biggest city in Sweden, where we have the common hospital for the whole south of Sweden. So that's why we get a lot of patients. And this is how it looks like. Uh, here is here is my lab. Uh, let's see if I can have this. This is my lab. Can you see my pointer? And uh, this is the clinic where, yes. I, where I work, just across the street. So I run around there as a cardiologist, like, like a maniac. <laughs> but uh, of course, research is my hobby. So I'm very passionate about this. And this is how our clinical research center looks like. I hope that you can come and visit sometime. <laughs> um, let's see. Well, you are experts on atherosclerosis, but... Uh, I always like to start by reminding us that this is really important what we are doing. Uh, it's not just my hobby, but I really see people that are having heart attacks and strokes all the time. And uh, it's really the cause of the biggest cause of death all over the world. So we are really all together doing a very meaningful job. Um, and of course, my favorite topic is the plaques and uh, we all know already quite a, a bit yeah. about the plaques. At least we can simplify it in stable plaques with thick caps and big uh, 
course, but not too big because they can be even bigger, more inflamed and more necrotic, causing uh, ruptures of the caps and full or partial occlusion of the lumen. Um, and then there is also this uh, other entity that I see from patients um, that is plaque erosion. It's much less known, uh, about only 20% of the cases that underlie events where you have an intact cap, but still develop a thrombus on top of that cap. It's quite mysterious and a lot more is needed to be known. <laughs> Nevertheless, these plaques are all over the place. If you usually have one plaque in one arterial territory, you may have in several arterial territories. Uh, we, that's why it's so important really to, to study and to detect these plaques timely. Um, we have also focused, I, I decided to have this talk showing a bit of the potential of the omics in our research, not only the spatial transverse omics, which is the thing we pioneered somehow, but try to give you a bit of inspiration how you can integrate the whole thing, all the omics you are you can do. Um, so very basic concepts are actually this plaque vulnerability concept that Mina also mentioned a bit. Um, and actually we could show that it's it's not just one component, not only the macrophages that are the nasty fellows in the plaque. Actually, it's a balance. So we we decided to really test this index, a ratio between stabilizing components like collagen and, and smooth muscle cells versus uh, the destabilizing components like macrophages, lipids, and intraplaque hemorrhage. So so uh, we could show that. This in our cohort of patients, it actually it was only a sub cohort of our biobank, only 200 patients. To have a high vulnerability index on a plaque uh, is actually very detrimental for you for the future, even after the plaque is removed from your body. So if you have one plaque that is nasty, you probably have other plaques that are also vulnerable in your body. Actually, we had some patients that had underwent bilateral uh, operations. So we had plaques from the right and the left side, one symptomatic and the other symptomatic. And we still could see that it was highly correlated. If they have very vulnerable characteristics in one side, it was also very highly uh, vulnerable on the other side. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so I let you introduce uh, Scandal. Yes. Yeah. It's a great pleasure to introduce the last but not the speaker who will move really into spatial systems, uh, Dr. Sikander Hayat from Department of Medicine too in the medical faculty in Aachen University in Germany. And Sikander will talk about spatial systems biology for reversing plaque phenotype using a novel spatial human atherosclerosis atlas. Sikander, thank you for joining us. Uh, dear organizers, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to to present some of our work. Um, and um, I'm also very happy to be the last speaker because I learned so much in the first two talks. And I hope that my talk could then complement what uh, you guys have uh, initiated so nicely. Um, I'll also give a disclaimer. I'm just a computational biologist. So uh, I hope that this is also opening space for collaborative research. And this is also what I really, really like. Um, so uh, I hope you can see my slides now. Um, I'm a group yes. leader at, at the University Hospital Aachen. Uh, this is on the right hand side, uh, our beautiful hospital. And the thing that I really like is this uh, kind of interdisciplinary work where biologists, vet lab scientists, medical doctors and computational biologists are working together to bring something that is useful then for the, for the patients. And um, these are my disclosures. Um, so in my team, what we are interested in is using all these single cell and spatial transcriptomics and any kind of omics data that you generate, um, you know, play with that, um, come up with, let's say, multimodal data representations and integration. So we talked about, uh, you know, different labs generating different kinds of data sets. And, you know, we talked a lot about annotation. So while you guys were talking, I added some slides and I hope that maybe we can also have a lively discussion on that. So, um, and then finally, in the third piece uh, in, in, in my team, what we are really interested in is how can we use all this data and kind of like use the novel methods that are coming out from like deep learning or machine learning to systematically find drug targets. And um, there we rely a lot on biomedical data. But at the end of the day, what I'll say is that, you know, also you will see these in the slides, you know, the, the benefit that you have of combining uh, artificial intelligence with 
with with real intelligence coming from people who have experience in the field for many many years is 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 i think the way to go forward okay so just to kind of give you a, like a very kind of one slide idea about what we are trying to do you know you take any of the data that you can uh, lay your hands on single cell spatial transcriptomics bulk rna seq you know generally what happens is that you do a lot of analysis and then all these analysis goes into like an excel sheet and this is then transported across the the lab and then you choose one or two targets which kind of sound exciting and then you try to validate them as the next novel target um which is really really useful but what we are trying to do here is have an additional layer of you know harnessing all the data that is out there um coming from let's say open targets the druggability uh, protein folding like alpha fold and also if you see here we have the subject expert feedback combine all of that into like a machine learning algorithm to then find novel targets so I added this slide while we were talking about, you know, single cell pipelines. So again, just my experience and my advice would be uh, spend 70 to 80% of your time on data cleaning and, and QC. The rest of the things will hopefully make sense if you spend a lot of time on, on, on things like, you know, um, checking the number of reads that map to mitochondrial genes, looking at doublets, looking at ambient RNA, number of genes uh, a, 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 a per sample, number of UMI counts, entropy of your data. So we spend a lot of time doing that. Then we do batch effect correction. Then we do unsupervised clustering. And then we play this beautiful game of uh, naming the clusters, which can also be like a, I don't know, a political game, which is very dangerous. Like, you know, people say this is this cluster, that cluster. So in my team, we have also developed a lot of tools which do this automated in an automated manner. But then we always go back to um, uh, subject experts to kind of like verify these things. Um, these are just my uh, recommendations uh, for the tools for uh, tools uh, that do downstream analysis. Uh, don't blame me if these things don't work as uh, as good for your data sets as for ours. This is just based on my experience, what worked well for us in the last five, six years. All right. Um, so again, um, the key thing that you want to do when you are kind of like working with multiple uh, samples or multiple data sets is to do batch effect correction. And um, what we found very useful was this paper, which came out in Nature Methods, where they talked about different ways to remove technical batch effects from your data while keeping biological signal alive in the data. All right. Um, so uh, we talked about um, you know um, um, cell type annotation. We talked about data sets, uh, small data sets, or you know large data sets being generated in different labs. This is a very interesting example that I started with the, maybe two years ago. You know, um, these are data sets from hard three data sets just showing you subtypes of fibroblasts from left ventricle human beings. Um, you can see that the left one shows you fibroblast subtype one, two, three, four. Middle one shows you up to eight or nine cell states. And the right one shows you a um, few other cell states. The question now is, can we compare different cell states across diseases? Can we identify different disease trajectories? And when can we find, let's say, unique and common mechanisms of the disease that you're interested in? So in this case, we were interested in fibrosis. So we developed some tools to kind of like annotate and integrate these data sets and come up with like unified annotations. And also, I think Professor Winter previously discussed about gene signatures. So we learned those gene signatures and also try to annotate these data sets. So then coming to the topic, coming to atherosclerosis. So I think this is... Uh, kind of like preaching to the choir. I think you guys know it much more, much better than me. But what we are interested in is um, what are the cell types that are involved in, uh, you know, in the in the disease progression, and uh, how do they contribute to plaque formation? What are the what is the role of immune cells? So we heard a lot about macrophages today. So I also added some some results from macrophages, um, cellular plasticity and migration, plaque formation and progression, and then finally, what is the spatial context of interactions between different cell types? Right. So uh, coming right to the point here, so we did mainly two things. We took all the publicly available data sets uh, shown on the left-hand side, which is 10 um, human uh, atherosclerosis examples and three controls. This is a uh, work also, a uh, similar kind of work that uh, we were inspired from uh, Professor Clint Miller's lab, where they have plaque view. And on the right-hand side, we generated novel spatial transcriptomics data using 10x technology, um, using 10x Visium, which is 55 micrometer spot size, and um, there we have roughly uh, 12 samples uh, with multiple sections per slide, and we cover controls, early stage of atherosclerosis, and then advanced stage of atherosclerosis. What we ended up doing was, again, QC. On the left-hand side, you will see 135,000 single cells, 
roughly 17,000 spots from the spatial transcriptomics. And then we did harmonization, integration, annotation, a lot of pathway analysis. We used that information to do deconvolution in the spatial transcriptomics data. And we found some spatial correlations and some, some spatial co-localizations. We did spatial differential expression. And then using all these things, we then generated some hypothesis. And I will try to show you some new results of uh, validation of, of those hypotheses, which are more about cellular modulation, cell cell communication, and a bit about uh, a drug response. OK, so again, this is a, a kind of a technical slide. Um, I don't want to explain a lot of these things, but I just want to give you an idea about how the integration can be useful and how you have to be careful with it. So on the left-hand side, we have the unintegrated data, which is showing each cell on a UMAP, which is just a 2D representation. And the colors are showing you the cells that are coming from the different data sets that we use in the single cell atlas. On the right-hand side, we show the same data, uh, which is now integrated and uh, showing colored by the different uh, disease states. And what I would like to kind of stress is that don't just look at the UMAP uh, uh, to kind of like say, okay, if this is data nicely integrated or not, but look at the quantitative features that we are showing you um, in the bottom. So we tried three different methods. We tried Harmony, we tried um, SCVI, which is a deep learning based method. And then we also tried simple principal component analysis. We calculated these eight scores for comparing bioconservation and batch correction. And then we had these aggregated scores. And then based on that, we made our choice which representation or which method to use for, um, for, for moving forward. And um, this is the end result. On the left-hand side, you see this uh, uh, nice UMAP, again, just a 2D representation of our integrated single cell atlas, where we identified 16 major cell types. Uh, we identified um, some you know, subtypes of endothelial cells, and we also identified VSMCs and um, pericytes, which we will also talk about uh, in, the, in the subsequent slides. Um, on the right-hand side, we, saw, we, we show the, the distribution of these cells um, in terms of where they are coming from uh, disease um, uh, samples or from controls. Um, for the non-immune cells, such as the VSMCs and parasites, we kind of like saw a balance between the controls and atherosclerosis samples. Immune-related cell types were more present in the atherosclerosis donor, which I think is also expected. So we then did subclustering. So basically, we took each major cell type, like let's say endothelial cells shown here in the middle, and then we redid the subclustering. We did, again, the batch effect correction, and then we found these subtypes. So there was a question in one of the earlier talks where like, how do you define that this is like a bona fide cell type or cell state? So there are multiple measures we could come up with, um, you know, if the marker genes are different between different cell states, if the pathways are different. But what we also found also very interesting was that if the cell types that we found or the cell states that we found were also spatially kind of distinctly located from each other, and then on top of that, again, then really talking to the biologists to, to or, or to medical doctors to really think about if these cell states are making sense or not. On the right-hand side, what we are showing is the proportion of these cell types, if they were coming from carotid arteries or from coronary arteries, and if they were higher in atherosclerosis samples or from controls. All right. So um, just to give you an idea about like, you know, after we had done all of these kind of like computational uh, analysis, um, we did um, a bit of uh, experimental validation. So these are immunohist um, immunohistochemistry slides. Um, we we, we uh, stained for markers for um, parasites and VSMCs shown on the top. And then we could basically show that the, um, the, the VSMCs and parasites were kind of located more towards, uh, so VSMCs more towards the media and parasites were more present. So the APOE positive parasites are more mainly present towards uh, the adventitia. Um, we did then, you know, differential expression analysis and pathway analysis. We have also heard uh, a lot about those two techniques in the in the previous two talks. On the left hand side, we just show you a rough kind of summary of where we found the differentially expressed genes. So we found a lot of differential expressed genes in parasites, um, in, in 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 immune cells, and also like in endothelial cells that we found in the single cell data. And on the right hand side, we just give you a summary of some of the top hits of pathways that we found to be differentially regulated in control versus atherosclerosis, which is shown by the color red and blue. So if it's red, that it's more prevalent in the atherosclerosis. If it's blue, it had more like an arthro arthroprotective uh, kind of um, um, flavor, like the interleukin-10 signaling that we found in macrophages to be shown in blue here. And what is very interesting is that these endothelial population one and two, which we defined by DKK3 and ACR1 
uh, marker genes to show kind of like different features in terms of also differential expression and then the pathways. And I'll come to that in the next few slides. But what you will also see is that the parasites were showing a lot of dysregulation and a lot of the pathways were upregulated in parasites, shown, shown with the red color. Okay, so just to go dig deep, I mean, just to kind of like give you an idea about like how, how useful or maybe you guys can have a different view, how useful these kind of modalities can be to really kind of like dissect the different kind of cell states that you might have. So we compared, let's say the endothelial type one and two, and the, the, the difference between these two transcriptionally and the difference between atherosclerosis um, and controls for just these two cell types. And what you see here is on the top and top right side, you see genes that are upregulated in endothelial two and atherosclerosis. And the bottom right is endothelial two, endothelial one and atherosclerosis. And on the left, you have the same thing for the, for the control samples. What we see is some of the top hits were more mesenchymal related transcription factors like FOXC2, TBX1. And uh, then for endothelial one, we found some collagen markers and some um, um, uh, other genes uh, related to kind of like um, more fibrosis, like RMTS5, uh, to be present in uh, differential expression in endothelial one. So we then looked at the protein protein interaction networks of these uh, these uh, these uh, uh, endothelial one and two uh, types that we found, and there we found um, quite interesting differences. For example, on the left you will see um, this protein that we found uh, endomucin, which could be relevant for um, let's say, um, uh, uh, leukocyte recruitment during inflammation. And on the right-hand side, again, we found these mesenchymal related transcription, fa transcription factors to be quite relevant um, uh, and also interlinked in the endothelial 2 protein-protein interaction factor. Um, then we wanted to leverage the, the spatial transcriptomics, and this is probably the new data that uh, hopefully will will also um, be 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 a bit more exciting for you guys. So again, you know, we took the data from uh, um, the spatial transcriptomics uh, fourteen samples that we had. We did spot deconvolution. So spot deconvolution is interesting and relevant for when you are playing with let's say ten x visium because ten x visium is fifty five micrometer slides, and there you really need to have um, you know deconvolution because each spot can have more than one cell. Uh, present in that kind of like region on the spot. And we could do that spot deconvolution using our transcriptomics atlas that we made using a tool called cell duplication. And then on the right hand side, you will see the majority of the cell types um, that we identified in our spatial transcriptomics and that they also had like a distinct and consistent positioning within each artery. Okay. Um, again, uh, to highlight the collaboration between, um, let's say, computational and non computational people, we did the uh, annotation in two different ways. In the bottom, we did the annotation of the spatial transcriptomics data using spot clustering. So we using all the, the transcriptomics data and the spatial data that we had and using a computational analysis. And we also then worked together with Professor Slimer uh, at the Maastricht University to then do the um, pathological analysis and do the pathological annotation using like, you know, like real human being and, and like, you know, uh, looking at the um, kind of like the pathology of the, of the slides that you had. And we could then compare the two things. So we could, like on the x-axis, we could show the spot clustering and on the y-axis, we look at the anatomic annotations. So we also talked about, you know, the quality of the data, right? And the quality of the data basically um, also shows like the inaccessible region, uh, which we found to be, let's say, low in number of genes and high in mitochondrial genes to be kind of like overlapping with the calcification and the necrosis region, which was then annotated by the, by the, by the pathologists. Um, we could then look into also the specific cell types that we had found. So we found EC1 to be more in reticia, EC2 more towards lumen. We found a higher count of immune cells in the atherosclerotic samples as compared to control samples. Um, a lot of these details that I'm going through, um, going through a bit fast because a lot of this is also available on the bioarchive that we have already put out. Um, again, just to kind of summarize things here, from the single cell data, we could find common markers like VFW, uh, VWF for, for endothelial cells, we could find DK2 population, which was just highlighting a subtype of the endothelial cells, and ACR1, which was highlighting the other subtype. And then we could show using e, e spatial data the different, uh, let's say, locations of these cell types. We could then also look into correlations between these different cell types. So we could predict, or we could use one cell type to predict the co-localization of other cell types. So I'm just highlighting you here the endothelial type 1. We use that as a predictor to then predict what are the other cell types that are co-localized with it. And then we found that the fibroblasts were co-localized with, with it in more the, 
the 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 advanced and the early stage atherosclerosis as compared to controls. We also found macrophages could predict the presence of endothelial two in advanced atherosclerosis uh, slides. Okay. Um, again, we could show all of this using spatial data as well. So um, on the left hand side, you see kind of a reference that we made from the arteries that we had. So going from center to the periphery, um, we could show the distribution of the different cell types, how it changes um, as you go from, let's say, the lumina to the periphery. As I said, EC2 was more towards the lumina, EC1 um, and the fibroblasts were more towards the adventitia. Immune cells very interestingly showed a bimodal distribution. And, um, and it, overall, we could also kind of like comment on the low count of immune cells in the controls, which is then shown in a similar kind of a plot, but then kind of divided by the different disease conditions. Okay. Um, then uh, to make things more complicated, we want to look into the crosstalk or the interaction between different cell types. So on the left-hand side, we are just showing you the rough summary of the ligand receptor interactions we found between different cell types using a tool called Crosstalker. Here you see that we could find some interactions between endothelial two in parasites, VHMCs and endothelial cells, and you know multiple immune cells and, and, and uh, our endothelial uh, populations. And then we could dig deeper into it to really find or find kind of like hone into certain ligand and receptors that were really specifically expressed in different cell types in the different populations that we were interested in. For example, on the right hand side, we show you endothelial one and two populations and their corresponding T cells or lymphocytes uh, and the corresponding uh, ligand and receptors that were found really specifically interacting on the space um, and, 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 and kind of like also explained a lot of the biology that we were trying to understand. So again, just to show you uh, how we could do this, um, we, uh, on the left, we show the endothelial and the macrophage populations on the spatial slides. On the right hand side, we show some selected uh, ligand receptors, for example, the CCL5 and ACR1 population, which were really spatially constrained in the uh, peripheral endothelial cells. We also found some populations which were um, really constrained in the plaque region. For example, the CCL5 and CCR1 interaction, which was kind of like only um, present in the plaque region. So these things are quite interesting. Again, um, highlighting the, the collaboration uh, with Professor Yap, we could find the co-localization of these ACR1 um, endothelial cells and, and their proximity to CD, CD4 positive T cells in Adventitia. We could find the presence of these immune cells using immunohistochemistry in the Adventitia, which was independent of outlaws. And um, this is quite exciting because then we could move forward um, with the subtypes of the immune cells we found. Again, we heard a lot about foamy macrophages and macrophages in general. We could show the distribution of these macrophages in the in the spatial um, slides um, in, in our data set. And again, then look into the interactions between these macrophages with other cell types. For example, we could look into the APOE and and, and genes like TREM2, which promote a foamy macrophage lipid uptake or elimination of excessive cholesterol from macrophages. And we could really pinpoint if these are really specific for the spatial locations that we have identified uh, from, from the spatial transcriptomics data. So on the left-hand side, just you know, listen to the first talk, I just had to add some of the macrophages uh, that we found uh, and the interactions um, of those macrophages with 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 the um, with other cell types, and and some of these things are known before, and some of these are, are we were quite exciting to we are quite excited to kind of like also validate or like look at the look at them from a, like a spatial point of view. All right, um, just to give you like an idea about how what were the biological hypotheses that we were trying to kind of understand. So, for example, here we were interested in the lipid uptake efflux and the interplay with the macrophages, and we found some. Um, a APOE-derived parasites in Adventitia, which were ex um, specifically expressed in CD36 uh, positive cells. Uh, and, and we found these uh, quite interesting interactions between um, um, uh, collagen 1A2 and CD36 in, in, in plaque and Adventitia, and not really in the, in the, in, in the controls. So um, again, I mean, this is kind of like, you know, um, quite exciting because this kind of like shows like how the spatial transcriptomics data could be useful for kind of like validating some of the existing hypotheses, but also generating new hypotheses. And, and another thing that we found quite interesting was that when we were moving from lumen towards um, 
the the um, uh, the adventitia, we could find a VSMC signature which was changing more towards myofibroblasts and then from to, to fibromyocytes. And um, this is just shown here on the top in the intermediate, uh, uh, let's say, arthrosclerosis, and on the bottom in, in advanced disease, disease stage, which was even more prominent, uh, kind of like to show this transition from VSMC signature to fibromyocytes. Uh, we could draw these trajectories using computational tools. So again, going from the left inside, it's a very complicated slide, but just to kind of give you an idea, on the left here, if you see my mouse, we had the green population, which is um, the VSMC population, then the middle population, which is the fibro, uh, the myofibroblast population, and the right hand side is the fibromyocytes. And if you go from left to right, which is how the pseudo time is ordered, you see kind of a very nice kind of trajectory of genes that are changing as you go from the left to the right hand side of this trajectory. You can do pathway analysis to find what are the pathways that are upregulated as you go from VSMC to a more fibromyocyte state, and then also look into the spatial, trans uh, 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 transcript uh, spatial transcriptomics data to then look at how these trajectories are evolving as you go again from one state to the other. Again, a lot of this is not completely new. I mean, Miller Lab has also uh, reported similar kind of transitions uh, in their um, fantastic paper in cell reports in 2023. Um, what is quite interesting, interesting for us is to kind of like to look into these uh, trajectories from a uh, spatial point of view, and then also again to look into some um, experimental validation, again shown here on the left hand side, showing some immunohistochemistry staining, showing the VSMC trans transition from controls when early, early atherosclerosis um, um, uh, stage, and just showing some, some kind of like selected markers for VSMCs from, from fibroblasts, from fibromyocytes. Uh, in the in the human coronary artery, uh, arteries. So we take this data now, you know, and then we move more towards like a systems biology approach where we try to then look into what are the drugs, what are the drug targets, where are they expressed in the single cell data, where are they expressed in the spatial transcriptomics data, and, and, and how can we then modulate these things to kind of like go from a disease state to a healthy state. So um, this is a tool that was published uh, last year in Nature, which is called Cell. Uh, it, the tool is, uh, well, the, the paper is more about cardiac niches, but they also introduced this tool called Drug to Cell. We applied that to some of our um, uh, data sets and then found some really interesting kind of like drugs that could be potentially relevant for certain cell states and cell types in our data. But then what we could also do, again, I'm apologizing that this is data from another um, uh, organ, um, uh, kidney, uh, data taken from kidney, Precision medicine, uh, medicine initiative, again, single cell data, and also some spatial data, where we could create these gene regulatory networks. Um, here we are showing you gene regulatory networks for uh, diabetic kidney disease and acute kidney injury. Just wanted to highlight that we can, we've created these gene regulatory networks also for the atherosclerosis data. And without even going into computational details, you can see what I've highlighted here is a transcription factor called 1x2. And you can see that the 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 the, the connections that this Runx2 is making is different between the left hand side and the right hand side. So um, a similar kind of approach can then be used for atherosclerosis. And I wanted to show this slide because we also talked in uh, we also heard about transcription factors in in the in 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 the previous two slides, uh, previous two talks. And what we can do now is once we have these transcription factors that we like, we can use deep learning based tools that we are developing. In, in my team to do in silico perturbation and then do a validation for that. For example, here we do an in silico uh, knockout of run X2 gene in our data, and then we can look at which pathways are then kind of perturbed based on this um, in silico perturbation. For example, here we see extracellular matrix and more uh, pathways relevant for fibrosis that were perturbed when we did this in silico perturbation of run X2. So, uh, long story short, um, I hope you will um, um, uh, look at the bioarchive paper that is already out there and also an update that we will soon release. I just told you some stories about um, bioinformatics analysis, how it could be maybe useful for some of the, the work that you guys are doing. Uh, we talked about macrophage interactions and lipid uh, efflux within the plaque region. We talked about a bit about new vascularization, VSMCG transdifferentiation, and, and uh, potential uh, recruitment of lymphocytes via peripheral endothelial cells. Um, based on the data analysis uh, that we presented. Um, I'm extremely grateful to the, the group of computational biologists in my team, especially Toro, uh, my postdoc who did a lot of this work. Uh, also grateful to our collaboration with Novo, who gave us the, the funding uh, for the postdoc position and uh, the spatial transcriptomics data. 
um, and um, immensely grateful to Professor Kraman, who is the medical director uh, of uh, Medicine Clinic 2, where I work, and, and a lot of medical doctors who constantly help us um, uh, with all the kind of like the, the interdisciplinary work that we do. Uh, and our collaborators, Professor Yap Bull and uh, Professor Judith Swimer um, from the Netherlands, um, who, who gave us a lot of feedback and a lot of um, kind of um, advice on finding the, the hypothesis, the old ones and the new ones and experimental validation. I'll stop here. Uh, I think I'm over time quite a lot, but thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Sikander, for a, a great talk. Uh, um, your hospital looks as spatial as your results, I have to say. But uh, I've been several times in Aachen visiting my friend Nico Marx. That's why I know it pretty well. Uh, questions. We are indeed running a bit over time, but I see we still have quite a bit of participants. So any any questions? Uh, the audience. There is a question actually uh, in the chat. Okay. From uh, Dmitry. Uh, so thank you for your talk. Uh, you highlighted an importance of data processing. Could you please specify what obligatory steps should be in the best practice data integration? Ah, definitely, yeah. So, um, I mean, as I said, I think you, you have to spend a lot of time on, on QC and a lot of the QC, if you do it right, then the rest of the things and the rest of the story kind of like looks very clean. Um, I would suggest that uh, what you have to look at is is this part i hope you can see my mouse here you know where you are looking at the 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 quality of the the samples um in terms of like the number of reads that you have in in terms of the number of genes you capture so we also had a discussion about you know what is the number of reads that you um or the number of genes that you capture in a, in a given cell uh or in a given spot so those are the things that are really really critical and um we do these analysis at the at the at the data set level but we also do this analysis at the sample level. All these things sound very tedious, but but you know, um, I believe if you if you have these pipelines, I mean these are computational pipelines. So once you have them, you can run them again and again. So I can highly recommend that you really look into uh, ambient RNA, doublets, number of genes, UMIs at the sample level before you do the integration, and then also after you've done the integration to look at the whole data set level, and then the next thing to do really take care of is do you have batch effects or not. Sometimes it's very hard to judge if this is a technical batch effect or a biological batch effect, uh, but but don't just look at the UMAP. Uh, look at the, the quantitative values that you are really interested in. And again, I would uh, point to in, in our study, as I said, we looked at eight different scores. So think about what is relevant for you. Are you more interested in biological conservation of the signature? Are you more interested in, let's say, some other properties of the data? And think about the actual quantitative numbers and then kind of like take the next step. If I may, I have a question. Uh, so you've mentioned that the, the 10x visium, it's a 50 micrometer uh, uh, resolution. Uh, so I, I was a bit skeptic uh, about the resolution, uh, uh, especially if you want to, to work on the mouse uh, tissue because they are much smaller. Uh, so. <clears throat> I had a question. You know that now there is a 10x Visium HD. I, I I was wondering if you had your hands on already. Uh, what do you think about uh, this new this new tool? Would you recommend it for us, especially for those working uh, on mouse tissue? I think, as uh, Professor um, um, Goncalves said, that you know we are at the beginning of the history. Um, so uh, at this point. Um, I would say, so we have, yes, we have hands-on uh, with the um, uh, Visium HD. We also have uh, Mirrorfish. We also have Xenium. So um, I, so there's a balance you have to kind of like, uh, you know, kind of talk about. So as the technology is evolving, I would say the quality will improve. I would say Visium HD is quite good. It is genome-wide, so you can, you don't have to do like a gene panel selection and and, and, and you know, select what you really want to look at. But all these things come at a cost. So if you really want to look at subcellular localized, subcellular location, uh, you know, single cell resolution, sub even subcellular location, um, uh, so, sorry, subcellular um, uh, resolution, go for things like Mirrorfish and 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 and, uh, and 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 Xenium. But if you are happy with let's say five micrometer 
um, then you can go for like things like uh, uh, Visium HD. Um, you will always have to pay a price. Also, you will have to literally pay a price. So, you know, 10x uh, spatial or 10x transcriptomics is already expensive. But if you go to these newer technologies, it's kind of like, you know, buying a car, like 30,000 euros or, or um, you know, so for like running a decent size experiment. So uh, I'm very happy that I don't run, run like a data generation lab. Um, and these are the things that you have to really care about, right? And also like, think about this. If you do this experiment and at the end of the day, the quality is too bad, then you're kind of like 30,000 euros down the drain. And for that, I, again, maybe there was a question there. I have a recommendation that we always do shallow sequencing first, which is cheaper. If you find a signature there and then we go to the, the next round and also then looking at the rings and those kind of qualities. But yeah, I mean, this is kind of like a bottleneck that you always have to kind of play with. If you have unlimited money, uh, which I think none of us has, then I would go for like, you know, like, you know, I would go for uh, a Visium uh, HD and then maybe do like a, like a, a really interesting section with uh, with high resolution Mirrorfish. But I think, you know, uh, money is the limitation. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Any other questions? So if not, I guess that they are all uh, hungry or something like that. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks again uh, for 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 your presentation. Uh, that was really really inspiring. I hope that uh, everyone enjoyed it, and now they will start tomorrow for their first experiment, doing spatial transcriptomics and single cell analysis. But if you want to conclude, um, I couldn't conclude better than you did. I want to thank all the participants we still have quite a few uh, with us even though it's quite late already and uh, especially the three speakers it was really uh, a pleasure for us to have you uh, by this webinar so thank you very very much and uh, I would say uh, chin chin with a glass of wine but <laughs> <laughs> I think those days are over <laughs> that we did that so uh, just uh, a new <laughs> evening and thank you. Yeah, that sounds more like coffee, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you so much. It was lovely yeah. to join thank you. you. Thank you. All. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hope to see you Great talk. soon in live conditions. <laughs> yes, the same. Thank bye you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye.